Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This is Andy Gervich. I'm the president of the Anthropology of Consciousness. This is our 39th annual conference. The theme is Sea Change, Life Worlds, and Ecological Upheaval. Um, I'm so excited to have you all here because this is really groundbreaking time for all of us. This is, I don't need to, to reiterate all that most of us have been through for the past year and a half or maybe longer. Um, it's been a very challenging and difficult time and it's really a time of intense and, and, and rapid uh, transformation. Um, and this conference is really a groundbreaking opportunity for us. It's our first fully online conference. Um, it's the most diverse, it's the most accessible and it's by far um, the least ecological footprint of any conference we've ever held. Uh, we have people from all over the world joining us um, to share their expertise. We have a full schedule and I'm excited to get started. I just want to mention a few things as we get going for functionality. Um, since we're all working together to, to sort of create these new spaces, I, I do understand that there's been some glitches and it's been a little difficult for folks to get registered on the AAA page to find the communities page, to find the links. Um, we're trying to iron most of that out and be in contact with us if something doesn't make sense, if you're a presenter or an attendee. Um, but as I said, take some joy in the fact that you are really a, a, a trailblazer in helping to create these new spaces for us to be able to interact with one another uh, in, in capacities that we never have before. And I think even after this pandemic subsides, we're gonna be uh, progressing in these kinds of spaces together for, for years to come. Um, a few things in terms of the conference format. And so we're gonna be in webinar format for most of our sessions, right? And so what that means is um, the panelists and presenters are going to be on your screen and you're gonna be able to see them and hear them. But if you're just attending the event, your camera and your microphone will not be on. Some of you have not been in a Zoom session like that before. And so we'll be handling the Q and A through uh, chat. And so if you look on your screen there, you have a couple of options. There's a Q and A box. Um, and then there's also the chat box. And so if questions arise during the presentations, as I'm sure they will, please post them in either the Q and A or the chat. It'd be better to post them in the Q and A so we can keep track of them, but put them in either place in the Q and A or the chat and I'll be gathering them. And then when it comes time for the question period, uh, we'll go ahead and share those questions with the panelists. And if we need to, we can turn on individual people's microphones at that time if you wanna actually directly speak to the panelists. Um, another thing I wanna say is please keep an eye out in the chat box because we're gonna be putting some things in there as well for you to have a look at some upcoming sessions for the day for you to have a look at other things we have going on through the conference, stuff about some of our keynote events for tonight and tomorrow. Um, things about decorum and rules for interaction on Zoom and how we wanna make sure we keep this a safe and, and thriving and welcoming space for everyone. Um, please do if you would like, um, and you don't have to do this, but uh, think about um, by way of accessibility and just uh, um, keeping the space uh, open and, and welcoming for all different kinds of folks, maybe add your preferred pronouns to your name. Um, we uh, we'll probably will start most sessions with a land recognition as well. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, which is the home of the uh, Kathlamet, Chinook and many other tribes and bands. And I'm here speaking to you today because of historic injustices that have been done to those peoples and moving them off of their lands. And so we wanna acknowledge that and thank them um, and honor their sacrifice uh, that allows us to be here today. And uh, so much of the work we're trying to do in this conference is to try to right some of those historic wrongs. Um, and so without further ado, I actually wanna hand things over to our panel chair. It's Meryl Shriver Rice. The first panel is entitled Evocative Ethnographies of Florida Silver River, Biodiversity, Boundaries, Life Experiences, and Conservation. So Meryl, please take it over. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Meryl Shriver Rice, and I'm the director of the master's program in environment, culture, and media, of which all of these uh, presenters are students in this program. I would like to also start with a land acknowledgement. The University of Miami acknowledges the ancestral and traditional territories of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Council Miccosukee Seminole Nation Aboriginal Peoples, and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, who are the original owners and custodians of the land upon which we stand and learn. I would like to now introduce Dr. Amanda Concha Holmes, who 
uh, joined our class and worked with us on her own innovative form of ethnography called evocative ethnography that really led uh, our class's projects that you will see today. So without further ado, go ahead and take it over, Amanda. So, um, so today I'm just going to offer a little bit of an introduction about what evocative ethnography is all about and what we've been covering in, in class and what the hopes of it are for, and then a little bit of context about the Florida Silver River. So this in part is coming from um, my research on the Silver River for the past over a decade now that was funded by the Winogrin Foundation. And currently I'm writing a multimodal manuscript um, uh, that's funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities that will be published with Afro PWW, which is Publishing Without Walls. So with me being immersed in that project, I, I partnered with Meryl in her class to be able to, to, to sort of um, work with some students with these ideas of art, ethnography, and uncovering more um, underrepresented voices. So what is ethnography? Ethnography, a really critical aspect of it is this idea of power, honestly. The process of representation, who are you choosing to tell the story and how are you interpreting and translating these cultural norms um, is an exercise of power. And what's evocative about it rather than representational, and this is a key aspect of what you're gonna be seeing today with the student's presentation, um, is the different framing. So the framing that's focused on feminist decolonial theory and methods that highlights fragmentation rather than categorization, and that really tries to emphasize an embodied sense rather than rational cognition in terms of emergent improvisation. Emergent improvisation is this act of self-organization where there's no continuous leader, there's no predetermined script, and where ensembles create their own patterns. And that's what we're seeing today is this collective ensemble now creating their own patterns coming together. Fragmentation is a way of living with differences without turning them into opposites. And this is huge when we're talking about decolonization. Fragmentation is therefore a way of living at these borders, right? At the borderlands of human nature and how do we grapple with those issues? Particularly using Kimberly Crenshaw's from intersectionality, recognizing that these issues must be interpreted in multiple axes and not just a single axis analysis. Um, taking from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, recognizing that there is that we shouldn't just recognize a single story, but indeed the multiplicity of stories and the different aspects of the stories to avoid falling into traps of stereotypes and to offer more rich nuanced analyses. Audre Lorde helps us interpret that in terms of poetry. So how do we offer these poetic um, interludes so that the poe poetry becomes fused with theory? And with that, recognizing that poetry then is not a luxury, it's a vital necessity to be able to have survival and change because it's the poetry that first made into language, then it can become an idea. And when it's an idea, it be can become tangible action. So evocative ethnography breaks down the colonial division of subject object, of human nature, of physical, spiritual, and native non-native for a lived experience of mutual becoming. And this mutual becoming is this mimetic dance, right? It's this, it's an event in which all parties become transformed. And that's true for the research itself. That's true for um, hopefully today's event. So that when you experience some of these projects that the students are sharing, that there also will be a mutual transformation. That transformation is hopefully an act of healing an act of transformation, of decolonization, and of mobilization, four of the major tenets that Linda Dewey Smith offers in her, what she calls the indigenous research agenda. And these are what's guiding the principles of today. Using art as a method, as Natasha Myers explains, so that it can alter our ideas about what we can see, sense, feel, and know, recognizing how colonial and limited often our forms of knowing are and to develop the skills for expanding these ways of knowing and being in the world, 
towards a sense of becoming. Using sound to be able to recognize place and to highlight underrepresented voices. So evocative ethnography favors a sensorial realm to explore, interpret, and share sensations, stories, and meaning through emergent improvisation. It includes provocative techniques of videography, acoustomology, and photography. It includes aspects of proprioception, kinesthesia, and counter narratives rather than a single meta narrative, rather than um, uh, the, the typical arc. Right, you'll see that a lot in the experimental forms today, using things like montage and non-narrative structures, non-human agents as the as the major perspective, and sound voyages. So today we'll be talking about the Silver River in Ocala the National Forest, which is in Florida, in the U.S. of A. And specifically about the Silver Spring State Park. This is the Head Springs. And this is Mammoth Springs, where with some underwater archaeology, they found um, a mammoth kill site. So mammoths, we know we're, we're traveling about these lands, as were alligators from the time of the Miocene, 18 million years ago, as were manatees, the Florida sea cow. And much later on in from the 1800s, 1500s, the Creeks began to come in. In the 1800s, um, enslaved Africans escaped the South Carolina and Georgia and became to be known as the Black Seminoles here in Florida. So this one, um, his name is John Force, also known as Juan Caballo or Juan Caballo, and go for John. And he was born in 1812. Um, from with African American, Indian, and Spanish heritage. Um, and he's one of the most successful Black freedom fighters. He spent his life as um, fighting for freedom of his people and for trying to attain land where they could be, stay on. Um, finally, wound up in Mexico after his, his fighting in the wars here. Osceola was also at, at the Silver's River. Um, and he's one of the many things that he's known for is for the 1834 meeting with the US government when the government was trying to give him a treaty to say, all of your people need to move from the Florida and leave these lands. And he put a knife into the treaty and said, basically, the Treaty of Moultrie, we're not interested. That's not, we're not relocating. Um, and that has a statue up at the Civil War to recognize that. So there's three major seminal wars, um, many of which you'll notice are around the, the area of the Silver River, um, right where Fort King is, the Dade Massacre. And so this was a really important part for um, Native American heritage, Black Seminoles, um, African descendants. And this is a heritage that is, is not often spoken of, or if it is spoken of, it's often spoken of from a colonial perspective of Andrew Jackson and of re removing the Indians in a, as, as, as if it were positive, right? Because we were inviting tourists, we were inviting um, perspectives, we were trying to get people coming um, down into Florida to be able to create the citrus industry, to create um, the mining industry. Here's a steamboat that was very big in the 1800s, um, bringing tourists into Florida in, um, and this was right along the Silver River. Um, another um, element that's on the Silver River are the, are the monkeys. There are rhesus macaques that come from Asia, and Colonel Tui Tui brought them, four to eight of them, and put them on the that little island because he thought he couldn't swim, and then they they swam off, and they began populating. Um, studies in the 60s showed them about at 78, and then they got up in the 80s to 300s. But then in the mid 80s, there were um, conser conservation, it became a state park. So then the whole ideology of conservation came and what that means and how you should interact with what was now considered not a welcome species, but a non native one. So it went from feeding them and this being a wonderful, beautiful thing for the tourists 
and for the non-toaster light, um, they would actually have special monkey chow. Then they were no longer allowed to feed them or touch them, and they actually began to be trapped um, and sent off to laboratories for experiments. Um, and so you'll notice that then in the 80s, it came down in the 90s as well, until um, there was a civic scientist in the um, early 2000s that began to know these monkeys. And then we did some ethnoclimatological research and found about 100. So the civic scientist is Bob Gottschalk. And what's interesting is, is he starts letting us know more of the personalities of these monkeys. So we have four groups along the Silver River. And we have very specific monkeys. So it's not just the monkeys. We now have Slacky or King Philip. Um, he was able to recognize the, the alpha males and the alpha females and some of the others, and really understand some of their behaviors, who they are. So you've got needle nose and bobtail and scar and flat top. Right? So he named them and he really got to know them um, as he was interacting the river and he was sharing that with us. So they become um, individuals that we can get to know. And so this is one of the major parts when we're uncovering these underrepresented stories we're asking who belongs and who gets to be to belong and whose stories get to be told and specifically how. So Cynthia Wilson Graham is also um, keen on uncovering these underrepresented histories. And she, when she was um, uncovering Paradise Park on Silver River, which is another underrepresented history that um, few people know about and even fewer talk about. And so she published a book on, in 2015 about the Paradise Park, which was there from 1949 to 1969, to put it back on the map. Because most of the history books and most of the maps completely erase it. Um, and so this was a, and, and we'll, we'll see more about this in one of the presentations, that this was um, a, a paradise for um, only Blacks during a time of Jim Crow South of segregation of otherwise intense violence. There was joy and there, as she highlights, there was Black professionals. So doctors, lawyers, business owners, civil rights leaders, educators. Um, and this is critical to know because this is not the history that's written down in history books and it's not the history that gets shared in school systems. Um, but by the late 1800s, 73% of Marion County was made up of freed African Americans. And this is huge and critically important when we're talking about the history of this, this area of the, of the region. And she highlights people like Dr. E.C. Mitchell Hampton, who's the first African American woman to become a doctor in Florida. And she was the daughter of an ex-slave. She set up a practice in pharmacy in West Broadway, which became like the Harlem of Ocala. Um, Dr. R.S. Hughes, that in 1925 established the American Thrift Association Hospital, also on West Broadway, and Dr. Lee Royal Hampton, the first Black dentist. And she recognizes these folks um, to be able to highlight their stories and reinsert them into our common history. So whose stories get told and how? And I offer this to the students, and I also offer this to all of our participants to really think about which stories will you tell and how will you tell them? How can you use your voice, your camera, your publications to tell the stories that need to be told but are not being told? Thank you. Thanks for that brief intro, Amanda. Um, so I'm gonna start us off with my classmate, Brittany. Um, we're gonna be the first two students presenting. And you'll notice a lot of shared imagery that you saw on Amanda's um, presentation as well because there's hardly any footage, archival footage of Paradise Park. Brittany and I are gonna be focusing on Paradise Park. I'll let her give a brief introduction to her own project afterwards. But what I'm gonna be focusing on is kind of using um, interview footage of Cynthia, who Amanda highlighted. And I'm going to be overlaying that with archival footage as well as contemporary footage from news outlets and other um, like more contemporary media um, outlets. And basically what I'm trying to do here is to demonstrate that while yes, Paradise Park was a safe haven for people, 
Cynthia's entire story is not about just highlighting the doctors, the lawyers, the successful people. Her story is about highlighting the fact that these injustices, while they previously manifested, are still manifesting every day. And while they may take different forms, a lot of those forms are actually still the same. And you'll see that in my video, but I wanted to just highlight that they're really, while slavery is no longer legal, we're still seeing these really heinous forms and acts of racism in our country today. So I didn't do any editing over Cynthia's voice at all. Every sound that's there is exactly as it was when we recorded her. And I wanna do as much justice to her story as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. And then if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to ask those later. But I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen now. And if everyone could just mute their um, microphones, please. 2000, we were doing a census with the city of Ocala. They had a weed and seed program. And Bill Patton, who worked for the city, mentioned all of the rich history of African-Americans in Marion County. However, I hadn't heard anything about most of them in school. We hadn't been taught. And I was at Howard Academy in 2004, and I noticed they had this picture of these women and men hanging off the side of the glass bottom boat. I had always seen the men and women, but none of them looked like me. This picture happened to look like me. Everyone on the boat looked like me. You could go to Paradise Park, basically, you could see every, everyone coming and going in the park. But we're talking about doing a time of segregation, lynching, was happening, finding someone in the side of the street, hanging from a tree, the Groveland for Rosewood being burned. It's so many things that was happening all at the same time, but we still found a way to enjoy family, culture, religion, and friends away from it all. We didn't have hotel accommodations. We only had one hotel that would accommodate us. So the hotels that they had on the ground, they could not stay here. They could not stay around the Springs. So they had to stay in boarding houses or sleep in their cars. And they came from all over the United States by the bus loads. So that part of the culture is gone, is lost, and you don't hear anything about it. Even on your boat tours, you don't hear anything about Paradise Park. If you rented anything, the kayaks, the canoes, you didn't hear anything about Paradise Park. You would not know that Paradise Park existed at all at Silver Springs had you not come here today and listen to me. It's a lot of interesting history here in Marion County, but just to stay with the Paradise Park piece of it, 20 years it existed, it closed very quietly, and that part of the park was not integrated into Silver Springs at all. Brittany, if you want to take it from there. Yeah, so I can take it over from there. Um, so Shasha, as she said, we have a lot of the same footage because there's very limited footage, but my aspect is more of to tell you about the history of the park itself and um, moving forward, I guess. It's critical that the history is documented for all of the cultural history of the Springs and other places as they exist and we not worry about how and why we're doing it because our history, your history, is just in part as important as the American history. It is a part of the American history. And that everything 
about African-American history is not all slavery. There were kings and queens, but they need to understand that we, we were not all poor people that didn't like to work. Our heritage was taken. We were brought over here unwillingly. Our language was taken, our culture was taken, and we still um, survived. And Paradise Park was one of those places where we could go let our hair down and not worry about the humiliation that you would find in a lot of other places. So Paradise Park was a safe haven. And as she as she's saying that it was off the beaten track, you could go to Paradise Park, basically you could see every, everyone coming and going in the park. But we we're talking about doing a time of segregation, but um, the music, we had the jukeboxes and um, the pavilion and the food, the different types of food, the beauty contests, we had Easter egg hunts, we had baptisms. Although the park was here in Marion County, it was the park. There was little to no history on Paradise Park at all. The park closed in 1969 without a trace. It was supposedly supposed to be integrated into Silver Springs, but most people you ask, they would say it's more of assimilation than integration because we lost a our culture once we came to Silver Springs. And some people still have not ever came through the gates of Silver Springs um, that went to Paradise Park. So that part of the culture is gone, is lost, and you don't hear anything about it. Even on your boat tours, you don't hear anything about Paradise Park. If you rented anything, the kayaks, the canoes, you didn't hear anything about Paradise Park. You would not know that Paradise Park existed at all at Silver Springs. Had you not come here today, and listen to me. It's not just way back when, it, it, it's still happening. Hate goes on a long time. Yeah, it, it, it's still happening, but we can change that fabric one person at a time by the way we act, the, by the way that we treat the next individual. And even though I'm one person, I speak for many people, and some people are afraid to talk. They uh, refuse to share their story because of whatever the reason are and things are still happening to people where they're disappearing. How we stop that action is how we treat the next person. If you see something happening, say something. It could be one of us. What are you gonna do to change the culture? What can you do as an individual to change the culture, to stop some of this action that's happening against people just because of the color of their skin? So I wanted to show you more of Paradise Park now and in the past and Chris can take it over with Sarah now. All right, so um, thank you Brittany and Sasha for the kind of historical look at the Silver River. Um, Chris and I are taking uh, an ecological approach, focusing on some of the species and wildlife that inhabit in the river. Um, and I know uh, like Meryl and Amanda said, um, uh, the Silver River is on Seminole land, so all of this footage was taken there. And then I am reporting here from Miami, which is Miccosukee land, like Merrill mentioned. Um, so my piece, I wanted to um, focus on um, a lot of people. The day we were there, there were a lot of people, and I really experienced a lot of kind of like murmurings of being bummed out that there wasn't any manatees, which are really common to see. Um, and I just wanted to challenge what we see as like the fun animals to see and what's the charismatic megafauna and would we care more if we knew how important certain species were and kind of any um, species that you'll see in my footage, you know, if they disappeared tomorrow would cause a collapse of everything at the Silver River. So um, I just kind of wanted to challenge that and engulf everyone in to this kind of wildlife.
All right, so um, that was my kind of holistic view of everything that's going on. So that quote, um, it was a little hard to hear, but it was um, a man saying like, there's not too much stuff going on today. We're here in the middle of the weekend. And it was kind of like, I looked around like, there is so much going on, just not some of the, you know, the big megafauna that people love to see. Um, but there was so much going on and I just wanted to challenge the idea of like focusing on the things that we're not really conscious of when going in a place like that. Like you wanna see the monkeys and the manatees, but there are a lot of really important species everywhere you look and everything is super interconnected. Um, and then Chris took a focus on the monkeys that you saw the footage of. So I'll hand it over to Chris. Yeah, thanks Sarah, that was, that was great. Um, yeah, so I took a little bit of a different approach. I, I wrote a poem, a bit of a prose poem, and I laid it down um, in Adobe Edition. Um, and I threw in some surround sounds of uh, the rhesus monkey, uh, the rhesus macaque, as Amanda mentioned, that were introduced uh, in 1938. So they've been there for 80 years. So each stanza focuses on a different aspect of their history as a species um, pertaining to uh, the actual river. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, it's an audio file. So I encourage you to also, you know, you can close your eyes if you want. And if you have headphones, it might be a little bit easier to listen. Um, and if not, it still, it still sounds good, so. Just give me a second, let me share the screen. Silver River Secret. Pale brown or gray, pointed ears, pink in the face. Protruding eyebrows with eyes that are almond shaped. Malafodont and molar teeth biting down on roots, fruit, and seeds. Native to Nepal and Vietnam. Feral colonies in the United States. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. First primate astronauts who aboard V2, Jupiter, and Atlas rockets. Albert reached space. Abel returned safely. Scatback was lost at sea. From the Ralph Mitchell Zoo to the National Air and Space Museum. Sightings from South Carolina's Sea Islands to Silver Spring State Park, Central Florida's National Natural Landmark featuring concessionaire Colonel Tui's Tarzan-themed Jungle Cruise. Silvery, short, spring-fed, six strong swimming rhesus macaques slivering away from their small island via the Silver River situated within the state park set the stage for another six to do the same. Fish, Burmese pythons, rhesus macaques. A diverse, diverse diet includes native insects and invertebrates. CDC claims 30% carry herpes B. Certain population increase due to rapid breeding. Captures of sought after creatures sold to biomedical researchers require swift action by state agencies. Okay, yeah, so um, might be a couple of questions. Um, I talked about 
a couple of, uh, or a variety rather, of different, um, I guess, of their experiences that they, uh, that the monkeys have had, not just on Silver River, but, um, but across the country. Um, so yeah, I hope you like it. And now we have Georgia and Caitlin. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Georgia and I decided to call our two pieces, uh, who is speaking combined. Um, and both of our pieces are exploring the human relationship with the river, uh, whether that's using it and going out on kayaks and using it for personal pleasure and leisure, or an even larger sense of using it as a spot for filmmaking and to make Hollywood films because Silver River has been used as a location for a few Hollywood films as well. Um, so I will start with my piece. One thing that I, I found striking when I was on the river was all the sounds of everyone that was there. Um, and one thing that I've really been thinking about is how do you give back to the river when you're on it and you're using it as leisure or for pleasure? And then how is the river experiencing the humans that are there? So my piece is playing with the sounds that I recorded of different people speaking on the river that day. And Georgia, do you have the file? Okay. Okay, you Again, what I was trying to focus on here is just the different sounds um, and what it might be like for the river to hear humans um, and try to use this as a piece to just for myself and other people to be more aware of 
their actions and their behaviors when they're on a place like Silver River and how their behavior might be affecting the place and the animals that live there. And then along with that, also thinking about the use of the film camera um, and filming it and even going in to edit this footage together and putting it together and how do you create narratives that support conservation efforts and not diminish them in any way? Um, how do you tell appropriate narratives, narratives that are not giving a bad image to the river or perpetuating uh, negative ideas about some of the creatures on the river as well. And with that, I will give it to Georgia so she can talk about her piece. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just kind of going from there, I think I found myself after we, we had an opportunity to interview uh, Mark Emery, who is um, a National Geographic filmmaker and cinematographer, and he's worked on all kinds of films on the river and has been filming there um, his whole life. And at first, um, when we got there and kind of had our river trip, I was had the plan of making a very um, like river focused textures of the river colors, kind of really using the evocative ethnography kind of visual scheme. Um, but then once we had the interview, I found myself really thinking about the legacy of cinema culture and the way that you know representations of nature have influenced our collective unconscious um, and our morals and kind of on all levels how um, like patriarchal values and colonizing views in the cinema industry have really impacted you know our collective belief system. Um, so I kind of decided to take a look at some of the films that have been made on the river. Um, and yeah, I think just share a couple of questions that I had in mind when working on this is, um, how do we know when something is right or wrong? Is that an instinct or is that, you know, constructed by society and how, how does that kind of play out? Um, and how far will we go to get the shot? Um, I think working in the film industry, that's something that has come up a lot for me um, and kind of watching the way that people work and interact with natural spaces and kind of who is being, who or what is being exploited in that process and what is the impact that it's having in the long term? Um, who is speaking? Whose point of view are we seeing? Um, and then kind of what is considered worthy? Like what is a worthy subject? Um, and then how is that worth portrayed on screen? Um, so with those questions in mind, I will share and I will try to optimize the video. I apologize, Caitlin, if, I, if your video was not optimized. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void. So this, this river here has memories for all of us. We've, a lot of us have done you know, anywhere from 80 to 90 movies that we've worked on here. So I ended up uh, working with a man who invented scuba with Jacques Cousteau. He lives here in town. He invented the underwater movie housings for IMAX, for everything. He did Jaws, Splash, Cocoon, The Abyss. He did James Bond. He did Preacher from the Black Lagoon. He shot all of those films. So a lot of the, the culture here has to do with filming too. And how do we capture what we think is very special here? Commercials have been done here. We did a Navy SEAL group where I caught an eight-foot alligator and tied a little bit of hundred-pound test to his tail, put it in front of them, and then swam out of the shot. And they swim through, and the gator moves out of the way, and it looks like the gator's moving away for the Navy SEALs to come through. So. You will know in your own heart when you're doing the right thing. 
Um, so, yes, um, so I guess what really kind of came up for me in the process was some of the common tropes that we find specifically in creature features, um, particularly like the woman's legs and being attacked from underneath in the water, you know, we see that in Jaws, we see that in other films that have really kind of, um, entered our unconscious, collective unconscious, um, and kind of thinking too through some of the animals that really have been, um, in my opinion, unfairly portrayed and vilified, um, like sharks and alligators um, and other, you know, scary animals um, that should be feared and that need to be controlled. Um, and just thinking through um, the way that women have been portrayed, the way that they're sexualized um, and victimized, and also the conflation of the feminine with nature um, and kind of the way those merge in, in cinematic history. Um, so yeah, and then finally, just also thinking about the literal footprint of filmmaking and as Caitlin had also touched on in her piece, um, and just, you know, in this, the creature from the Black Lagoon was made in 1954 when there weren't a lot of regulations um, in the industry, which there still aren't that many and there need to be more. Um, and just thinking about the, the ecological footprint of making something like that um, and the hundreds of other films that have been made on this river, as Mark mentioned, um, and so kind of in the second half, I really wanted to offer some kind of point of view of maybe what the creature would have seen or what maybe that experience is like, which I did with a GoPro. Um, and also just thinking about the algal blooms and some of the impacts of, of humans that are really having these long-term effects um, and kind of bringing it to a broader climate change uh, perspective. So uh, yes, Meryl, back to you. Thank you, Georgia, and thank you, everyone. I would, I would now like to open it up to any questions. We already have one question um, from Marjorie. 
Great presentations. Can you tell us more about seminal freed uh, black slave relations and history? Does anyone learn about this in any of your classes at UM? You wanna speak at all? I can say that um, it is my understanding from lectures I've attended that many freed enslaved peoples ended up in South Florida, ended up with this final hold out of, Semin of the Seminole Nation. Um, and they lived more along the coast and then were pushed into the Everglades where they still are today. And I can add that um, in addition to being in the Everglades, some of them um, also went out west and then some of those also then um, went to Mexico and some of the ones that went to the Everglades also went to Andrus Island in the Bahamas. Um, and so it became a diasporic um, Black seminal relation really. And there's been these sort of migratory relationships. And this has been one of the things that I think is, is critically important to highlight is that um, is the dynamism really of migration patterns for humans as well as plants and animals um, to be able to put it in that larger um, context, right? And so relationships with Cuba, with Venezuela, with um, the Bahamas, with Mexico, with Haiti um, have been a very consistent um, relationship with, with Floridians. And by Floridians, I, I'm, I'm referring to the caterpillars that we see in, in Sarah's, I'm, I'm referring to the monkeys that we hear in Chris's, I'm referring to the, um, the, the folks that went to Paradise Park, that some of them included um, heritage of Black Seminoles, um, sort of really uh, make that much broader, the way that we interpret um, who belongs and who's supposed to be somewhere. And we have another question from Stephanie. Hi, might panelists consider the way birds as charismatic species and as a symbol for biodiversity generally emerge in the human aquatic spaces of representation in which you have worked? We might panelists consider the way birds as charismatic species and as a symbol for biodiversity generally emerge in the human aquatic spaces of representation in which you have worked? Some of you so I will, I'll just quickly, before while everybody else gets ready, that I think birds are, are, are in, incredibly important, particularly on the Silver River and in all spaces. And again, at least in my framing, um, also reinterpreting um, who belongs. So birds help us really recognize also migratory patterns, right? So that these ideas of nations, these ideas of who's transient and who's a resident, um, shifts and shifts drastically. And so when we think about the Silver River, there's specific birds that come there um, and they live throughout the year. And then there's many other birds that that's a resting place, right? So you can tell what time of year it is because of which birds are there. Um, so I think birds are, are an incredible feature to be able to recognize and expand upon in terms of um, how we interpret um, natural spaces. Anyone else? Before the other panelists uh, jump in here, I just want to go ahead and say, uh, first off, you're all doing a wonderful job. I just want to remind attendees that to ask questions, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a, a Q&A button and you would click that and open it and you can type your questions in there. You can also do it through opening your chat function. Please do open your chat function regardless because we've been posting a lot of information there about uh, future panels and other things going on. So if you're an attendee and you don't have your chat box open, please open that. And then the Q&A box can also uh, be a space for you to ask questions. You can ask questions in either space. Uh, the Q&A would be easier, but it's fine to post them in the chat uh, box as well. And if you would like to uh, raise your hand and you want to actually speak to the participants directly, we can do that as well. So uh, go, go for it. I just wanted to make sure attendees knew all of the ways that they could connect with y'all. Thanks, Andy. Sure. Would anyone like to speak about birds in their work? I just, um, I love that uh, birds is a symbol for biodiversity because that's what I kind of try to do in my piece because, um, and birds are, they can be really charismatic. They also get a bad rep sometimes because, um, you know, especially with like pigeons, which are everywhere and that's a huge symbol and like seagulls are obviously a huge symbol for beaches, um, but tourists don't want seagulls around because they're annoying. Um, 
but I did, I definitely wanted to include birds to show that biodiversity because you don't have birds without insects and you don't have, you don't have marine life without birds. Um, and because they're kind of the first um, species to evolve. So I'm having trouble finding the words, but um, I de did definitely try to include as much bird footage as I could get um, to show the biodiversity. I think there's also something to be said about uh, thinking about deeper time and thinking thousands of years of humans living along the river alongside these same species of birds. And the birds, as Amanda pointed out, would have been a part of the seasonality that humans would have experienced. And as we visit the river, while biodiversity has been lost on the river, we can still experience some of the same birds. And, and so it was great that you guys captured some of those. We have another question I think you probably all have something to say about. I'd like, John says, I'd like to hear more about your process for editing video and audio. Was it a cooperative effort with the whole team and community partners? And I'd like to just, um, intro that by saying that the students were only able to spend one day on the river. So everything that you saw was actually captured. We had, we had to make a five hour drive from Miami to Silver River and the students really only were, were there like something like five hours to capture the sound and video. But go ahead, whoever wants to jump in on that. Um, I can hop in here. So I think that for our entire group, this was really collaborative, not in the sense that we were editing together just because of COVID, you know, we were not like proximate to each other, but um, we were sharing a lot of similar footage with each other because as Meryl mentioned, we had such a tight time constraint. So, I mean, if you're actually thinking about time, none of these were actual ethnographies, right? Just because we spent so little time there, but they're an exercise in ethnography. And this collaborative way, like I mean, for myself and for Brittany, we use a lot of archival footage and there are only two videos on the internet of Paradise Park. One is four minutes and one is one minute. And those are the only videos out there where we could actually pull footage to sh like showcase the um, like joy and happiness that these people were able to experience in this space. So I think that just, you know, given the context and also just the nature of our, our class and our um, project, it couldn't have worked if it wasn't collaborative. I mean, I know myself, I wouldn't really have anything to show if I didn't have other people to lean on. So that's just my experience. I'll just quickly say that the Paradise Park footage that there is there is in part, um, because um, Cynthia Wilson Graham was able to encounter it and it was in horrible state. And then Mark was actually able to find somebody to repair the footage. And you'll notice that in a lot of spaces that it's, that it's you know, you can see that it's in disrepair, but it was not even viewable before that. And so Mark was fundamental in, in helping find a professional to be able to actually repair it enough. And then when they've shown it, people, um, viewers have just been brought to tears to be able to see some of their own family members and recognize them on screen. So it's been a pretty phenomenal process. And it just goes to show how not only was Paradise Park um, really erased, not only from the history books and the records, but the park itself was raised. So all of this, this, the buildings that were there were actually raised to the ground, like completely destroyed. And so so ideologically it was destroyed and this was the idea of desegregation as integration but as Cynthia well said that it wasn't integration whatsoever it was just destroying cultural heritage um, and, and not valuing what was there um, but everybody created both incredible audio and and video compilations so please um, Maybe Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about your audio compilation? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, like we've mentioned, we you know, we were kayaking and that's how we got all the, and canoeing, um, Mara was in a canoe. Um, but yeah, we, 
I took a couple of sounds from monkeys that were previously recorded because we really, like we were able to see monkeys, not manatees. Um, that's why there's no manatees in any of these, um, in these videos, but um, the monkeys we briefly saw, but it was so crowded there. And I know Amanda mentioned that it was, it's usually not that crowded. So, you know, with the limited time that we had and the limited amount of audio that we were able to record and, or, and video as well, I, um, I don't know, I have a background in writing, so I decided to take it from that approach. Um, I was going to talk about just different rivers in general, like from the Amazon and whatnot and conservation, but I thought it'd be interesting um, and unique to, um, you know, feature these monkeys that um, have no, really no business being there, but unfortunately they were, they were just, you know, introduced by uh, this guy, Colonel Tui. And, um, and now, you know, they're non native, just like the, uh, Burmese pythons and, you know, lionfish as well. Um, so Florida is full of all these non native species, invasive species as well. So I don't know, I just threw in a couple of sounds, but definitely, you know, enjoyed this, uh, this project. And thanks for thanks for having us here. Appreciate it. Does anyone want to speak a little bit about how much footage was collected? Does anyone know how much we had total that you all worked with? Because I know you guys shared it all in one place or you attempted to share it all in one place. I can't speak to that because I, um, well, I loved that everyone shared footage with each other. I approached it as a challenge because I love a challenge and I wanted to do only things that I recorded personally because I wanted it to be kind of like all the things that one individual person can see and record on like a, um, I guess it was like a three hour kayak through the river. Um, and I did traipse into the woods a little bit after and got some more, but um, I think I only had like an hour total of footage personally, um, cause I did a lot of like short, you know, 10 second recordings. Cause especially when you're moving in a kayak, like you're just kind of like floating by what you're trying to film. Um, so it, at a certain point it was like, I would love to make that a 20 second clip, but there that bird goes and I am 10 feet down. Um, but yeah, I just challenged myself and was like, I'm only using what I took. Um, which is why there's some repetition, uh, in what I did, but I don't know total what we got. I'll, I can jump in and say that I definitely had quite a bit of footage, um, mostly because I dragged my GoPro attached to my kayak under the boat pretty much the whole way. Um, so that amounted to a fair number of clips um, and was also using my phone. So there's definitely more videos to be made from the footage that I have. Um, which, uh, yeah, and I know I shared some footage, but um, a lot will sit in my digital archive to be used at another time. We have another question that Amanda's mostly answered about question to panelists from Andy. The history of religion is in a way a history of human relationships to sacred rivers, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Danube, Ganges, Jordan, Nile, Amazon, Willamette, Columbia, Silver, et cetera. Can you speak to what happens when communities see the spaces as sacred and not just as resources to be used and exploited? Um, and Amanda's already said that the Tumukwa considered it a sacred waters and Paradise Park attendees would hold baptisms at the river. African-American sacred music, music from the Florida Folk Life Collection has the collection Shall We Gather at the River. Um, and I believe also all other kinds of sort of people who in a colonialist lens, explorers would try to, they were trying to find um, sacred sources that they heard through word of mouth um, amongst Florida's different rivers and springs, Florida was sort of known as the possible place for the spring of life. We've also have someone saying from David, hi panelists, good and interesting work. I'm in the process of establishing a small county park in central Florida, would love to get suggestions. Most immediately we need to come up with an appropriate name. And I'm sure everyone would love to talk to David about this. David, if you'd like to email 
um, me, me and Amanda, uh, we can definitely pass that along and maybe even do a Zoom chat with you. We'd love to help you talk through names and think through names, name titles. Um, let's see. Amanda also says most people I've interviewed over the years also reflect on the absolute awe they sense while on the river. That's actually been one of the major features um, and this is across groups. So whether we're talking women or men, people in yachts, people in uh, the smallest kayaks, people on a John boat, um, across economic ranges, across professional um, and across religion because I've, I've asked um, what people practice. And that's been the main thing um, has been the, the awe, the absolute awe. Now, the day that all of the students came to the river was one of the busiest days I've ever seen. <laughs> I've actually, in my years and years, I've never seen that many <laughs> people in one spot. Um, so I think it harks back maybe to <laughs> when the Silver River actually was the Disney World of Florida before Disney World. Um, but in recent times, it's, it's not been like that. Um, but I would say, um, and I think the relationship that when there is a sense of, of sacredness to a space, to a river, the hope would be that then there's also this ethic of conservation. Um, one of the ideas that I grapple with a lot, and I definitely ask people to question, is this idea of what conservation should look like? What does it mean? And to really recognize that conservation itself, when we talk about conservation policy, comes from an ideological framing that is colonial in and of itself. And so it conceptualizes nature as an object um, to be exploited or to be stewarded. And it creates a division between what is nature and what is human, rather than an integration. And I've been trying to develop this concept of human nature um, like that where it's really reflecting on that in, so that in-betweenness, that space of interconnectivity, um, to be able to, to challenge and go beyond um, this, this idea of separation. And this goes also um, to thinking about even um, joy. So when we think about what is uh, uh, not only our experience on the river, but what is the, the river's experience of us, like Caitlin was asking. Um, and if that river's experience of humans is also joy, then how beautiful. And if it's violence, how not, right? But what does that mean? So to um, a conservationist, um, and we'll see some of those volunteers in kayaks coming down the river and you know, helping people stay according to policy um, are often you know, um, white middle-class Americans from the North that who have either moved or are here transiently for the summers as snowbirds. Um, and so their relationship to the river is, is very different than say um, uh, self-professed rednecks who have um, generations of a relationship with the river. Um, and one noted example is how, how do you interact, right? So, <clears throat> a typical conservationist from the north will say, okay, well, you keep as much distance as possible, you don't interact, you don't intercede, you keep the human element out of the natural element, right? Whereas a typical redneck um, will be very engaged, right? So there's not this distinction so much. There's, here's a little baby alligator, well, let me pick it up, right? Let me show you, or let me play with it. And there's this, this connectedness. Now, what does that mean um, for conservation policy, particularly when we're talking about you know, uh, larger realms of people that may come to the river much like these students for the day, right? So they're not necessarily developing a long-term relationship. Um, that's, I think, why we have the conservation policies as we do, it's so that it goes to the, to the, to the lowest denominator um, that, that may not be developing relationships. But I do feel like this idea of um, sacredness is critical as is questioning what should conservation look like um, when we're talking about ecological becomings. I'd like to jump in here too and just um, also implore you, Andy, the, there's such a, um, I would implore you to look into some critical race theory and also potentially reading decolonization is not a metaphor if you haven't read it yet, um, because 
looking into fields of indigenous studies and also just critical race theory at large will explain just exactly why like people like us, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like me in this class and Amanda, like we're just, you know, we're all white people. And I think that there's a really big difference between identifying a relationship with your environment as a colonizer and indigenous people having a sacred relationship with their land. And there's a lot of historical context and a lot of power dynamics at play. And I think that while both are incredibly valid, I mean, I think water is a really big part of my identity in the ocean. But I think that looking into those power dynamics is really important in understanding what actually happens when a community views their environment as sacred. I also want to add, um, I feel like we're, you know, America and the, the culture that we're living in right now is obviously pretty secular and very capitalist uh, driven. Um, and I think that framework has the, the spiritual is not necessarily a big part of the way people are in their everyday lives. Um, and I guess I, I say that because I feel I grew up um, where there weren't any religious or spiritual values really pushed on me or um, I do consider myself a spiritual person, but I think, you know, for example, on a day like the day that we visited the river, the amount of people that were there and the drinking and kind of some debaucherous activities that some of us maybe witnessed um, didn't really lend itself to being able to have a kind of intimate feeling, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so I think that's something just for me is like considering the bigger picture of uh, what we value in our society. And I agree with Amanda that um, restoring some of the spiritual connection, I think is important. And it's something that um, we need to work on and replace with um, buying more stuff. And I'm putting in the um, section here. I will say where I'm from in Ohio, uh, we have a summer ritual of going to a river called the Little Miami in Ohio and it's called Cabrewing and it is very much a first warm day of the summer tradition. All the high schoolers and college kids go and canoe on a river that's not as beautiful as the one in Florida and drink and engage in all that debaucherous activity Georgia mentioned. And it very much is like a first day of summer tradition um, with all these high schoolers and college kids. Um, but it's just interesting to look at the, as rivers for ritual and things like that, being from a place where it very much is just a, uh, um, the Little Miami is just like a vehicle for these kids to party for the first day of summer. So that's just interesting. I just want to say we have about five minutes left for any follow-up questions or, or last minute thoughts. This has been a fantastic way to start the conference. I've actually bowled over by all of your presentations, um, by the thoughtfulness of your responses, by the thoroughness and engagement uh, of this activity. It's made me fall in love with this region and with each of you and your work. And I, I just am so thankful that you're sharing this with us. And I, I couldn't have thought, uh, I couldn't have come up with a better way to start this conference. And so thank you all so very much. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Any and last minute questions? Oh, go ahead, Meryl. Sorry. I was just going to say, just wanted to thank everyone who woke up this morning on a Friday. Uh, and I, I'm, it's not even morning for a lot of people around the world. So just thank you so much for attending 
our panel. And I'm, I think I'm gonna ask the students in the last four minutes, what was most surprising to you in the actual process of putting together your work? What surprised you the most in your creative process? I'm not really necessarily a filmmaker and what surprised me is how long it takes to just edit a tiny little thing. Um, took a lot longer than I was anticipating. Yeah, I can piggyback off that too. I have never made a video ever before this. So this was my first video and it was definitely an interesting and exciting process. Yeah, that's why I did an audio and a written portion because I am not good at videos, but I think all of us have, um, you know, our own, you know, creative talents that we apply to this program and what we did on the river. Um, and I think um, it's pretty unique, you know, all the stuff that we came up with. Uh, I wish we had more time, you know, as we all were saying, it was too busy there that one day, but you know, maybe another time Georgia can make another video with her, with her, uh, digital archive? Um, yeah, I think the most surprising thing for me was as someone who's worked in film quite a bit, um, I definitely went into the day with an idea in my head of what I was gonna film and how I was gonna do it, especially knowing the time constraint that we had and knowing what that can mean for making a film project. Um, and then just actually being really surprised by the opportunity that we had to do the interview section. Um, and I think I speak for all of us that we were really like um, interested to hear what both speakers had to say and were surprised by a lot of things that were said and the way they were delivered. Um, and so that really became like the thing that was at the forefront of my mind. Um, and it kind of put all of my planning of the footage that I was gonna get and that I did get, but that it kind of put it on the back side of, of what I wanted to address. So that was really interesting to kind of have that as a surprise opportunity. Yeah, it was very much, um, you can plan all you want, but you don't know what's going to happen. Like it could have rained when we were out there and that would have changed a lot of our plans too. Um, so it was very kind of like, you might have a plan, but you got it. You just have to go with the flow. I originally, I'm an artist and I originally wanted to do I had this whole idea for like a drawing and an animation. And then it just, you know, I got this great footage and there were just certain things that weren't going to work out. And so there was a lot of just kind of go with the flow um, on the day of and then in the editing process too. Yeah, I agree with that. I've also come from a filmmaking background. So I went into it thinking that I knew what I wanted to get and then was completely surprised by what I actually got. Um, and then how do I put all of the footage together and all the editing? Um, but I think another thing that just surprised me is also just thinking about my role as a filmmaker and, and going out into the space and getting these images and thinking about the narrative that I was putting together and thinking about, you know, what I'm, what, what is the story that I'm putting out there? How is this going to be perceived? Um, and I feel like that's something that I haven't necessarily thought of uh, before with my filmmaking. So it was a very self-reflective process for me. Yeah, I agree with Caitlin. I think that I was, this is the first time I've gone into some kind of visual content where the focus wasn't on me or what I was doing and being able to just let Cynthia's narrative take front and center and not include any kind of anything in there other than maybe some slight bias, but it's towards racial justice. So it's, it shouldn't be biased, but I mean, just allowing an actual narrative to just speak for itself and kind of moving away from what's expected and introducing more um, like unconventional forms of cinematography, like including the archives for a really long time at the end of mine, which is something I've never done before. I think that was really surprising and just kind of like not feeling uncomfortable by that. Like I was only feeling uncomfortable by the fact that like somebody might not want to sit through this long quiet piece at the end. 
And I think that that's like a shift in mindset that I've never experienced. So I was, I was surprised by that, but really enjoyed it. I just want to give my congratulations to everybody. Um, Cause I know that you're super busy with other classes and this class. And I know that there was a lot of reading that I assigned. Um, and I know that the ideas didn't always um, were sometimes uncomfortable and challenging. And that's what's amazing, I think, about really allowing yourself to immerse in them and to let the ideas themselves and the experience themselves, the river itself and all of the creatures help guide that process. And that you guys really did become this collaborative constellation. So it's the dynamic of all of you that was able to create what we were just able to share today. And then hopefully maybe share in another publication source. Um, so I congratulate all of you. Yes. Congrats and thank you so much for all of your hard work, everyone. And thank you again to everyone who who came and attended today. Um, uh, coming up is Buddhist and Feminist Approaches to the Climate and Environment at 1145. If you check your chat box, there's the link there to join. And Andy, do you want to say anything else to conclude? Yeah, I just want to, again, thank you all so very much for being here. Uh, to me, this panel represents so much about what what education is about and what anthropology is about and, and just the, the care with which each of you approach this subject, the, the clear love you have for the indigenous people of that land and for the water is evident and it was uh, infectious in the best way, probably not the best word to use during a pandemic, but it was just absolutely <laughs> spectacular. If I can just share my screen quickly. Um, just to point out to folks again, uh, our next panel, we have a break now and then at 1145 Eastern time, um, that's the next panel. The information is in the chat box. It's also here for you. It's also on the conference communities page listed. And that only works for folks who are registered for the conference. If you uh, haven't registered, um, we'd like you to, but if you'd like to attend, um, we would be happy to have some of the uh, panelists attend just uh, gratis as well. Um, if you have any questions for us, now would be the time to ask that. Uh, if not, thank you all so very much, and we hope to see you in future sessions. And please do uh, have a look at our happy hours each evening. That's a really great time for folks to come together and get to know one another and kind of share the work they're doing and, and make connections in a more informal setting. And have a look at our keynote for tonight as well, because it's a water roundtable um, with actually Indigenous activists uh, and others who are water protectors and water activists. And I think that panel dovetails absolutely. It's going to be a great way to close the day because it, it just picks up on everything that you, you folks have shared with us today. So thank you so much. <laughs>